Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Keith Willoughby, and I'm the Dean of the Edwards School of Business. Uh, that was 15 years in one minute. 15 <laughs> years worth of Haddock Entrepreneurial Speaker Series participants. As we gather here today, we acknowledge that we are meeting on Treaty 6 territory, traditional homeland of the Métis. I pay my sincere respect to the First Nations and Métis ancestors of this place, and I acknowledge those First Nations and Métis ancestors who cherish this land so that my ancestors from the Ukraine and from Norway and England could also live on the land in this province. I read from our relationship one with another, and as a non-Indigenous man, I commit my abilities to listen more and learn much. I warmly welcome everyone today joining in three-dimensional as well as virtually in today's 15th, yes, 15th annual anniversary event for the Gordon and Maureen Haddock Entrepreneurial Speaker Series. In true entrepreneurial fashion, I think we finally discovered a solution to the bone-chilling cold that usually attends a Haddock event. We'll meet in the spring. So welcome to spring 2022. And welcome back to a full in-person, along with hybrid um, Zoom broadcast for three-dimensional Haddock event. And a special welcome to many of the individuals I chatted with before today's event. Welcome to our current and future entrepreneurs who are involved today in the Get a Bigger Wagon event. Thank you for being inspiring with your stories and with your vision and with your passion. This afternoon, I have the pleasure of introducing Gordon and Maureen Haddock. Gordon and Maureen are great friends of the Edwards School of Business. They are both alumni of the University of Saskatchewan. Gordon graduated with a Bachelor of Commerce degree, and Maureen is a graduate of the College of Education. It's been said that um, they who give money give much. They who give time give more, but they who give themselves give all and the Haddocks have truly given of themselves. Besides their treasure, besides their time, besides their talent, they are true entrepreneurs. 15 years ago in 2007, Gordon and Maureen began the Gordon and Maureen Haddock Entrepreneurial Speaker Series. Today we have in, our, in attendance in this room, uh, Brent Lux and Penny Murphy, as you saw in the video, previous participants, previous speakers in this auspicious event. Every year since that, yes, every year, Unlike the Canadian Football League, <laughs> unlike the Junos, we never canceled due to COVID. The Haddocks went ahead. As with any entrepreneurial, adve entrepreneurial adventure, the Haddocks, and I would say the wonderful team, and I see many of my colleagues here in the Edwards School of Business, they worked on continuing and cultivating an event that I think it's as inspirational as it is aspirational for our dreams here in the business school. It's been said the best way to predict the future is to create it. So thank you to the young entrepreneurs and your families. Thank you to today's stellar guest speaker for truly creating a successful today by imagining the future of tomorrow and by living it right now. I'd like to now invite Mr. Gordon Haddock to come forward and introduce today's special guest, Mr. Alex Cruder. Gordon. Thanks, boss. <laughs> How are we doing? Is it still ringing in here? Oop, there we go. It's, we'll just do a little sound, soundboard. How's that? Is that better? I should talk to the radio guy, he knows. <laughs> you know, I, I, I come up here, it's like I'm speaking to a, a dental surgeon convention with everybody <laughs> with their masks on. But uh, this... Uh, event, before, we were just fooling around before we came here and Maureen says, well, maybe we should have somebody come up and slap you. <laughs> and then we get all this media attention. And if that doesn't work, I'll come up and slap you. So, <laughs> but uh, a, a little note, we're live streaming this, and which is different for us because uh, there's some people and students that are watching for, uh, from within the university, but there's people like Cindy Lowe down in Swift Current and her entrepreneurial class is watching, 
or Sheila Erickson and Steve in uh, Roadways Literacy Academy. Uh, they have an entrepreneur uh, class at their school and they're watching as well. So I guess we're broadcasting further afield. But, you know, it's our 15th annual speaker series and uh, what does that mean? And I thought the best way to describe what that means is describe it through the passage of time. And when I was thinking about that, uh, 50 years ago this April, I convocated from commerce. I'm surprised, Keith, you, you didn't remember that. <laughs> of course, Keith was in grade three. <laughs> but uh, I'll let that, that uh, slip by. But we began our series on January 23rd, 2007. And that was the 100th anniversary of uh, the U of S. Our dean was Grant Isaac, and Brett Wilson was our first speaker. And we were still the College of Commerce and didn't become the Edwards School of Business till July of that year. In 2010, the Rough Riders, celebrated their 100th anniversary. Our guest speakers were Colleen and Wally Ma, and Brooke Dobney was our acting dean. 2012 was the 100th anniversary of our Husky football team. Our guest speaker was Vaughn Wyatt, and Daphne Terrace was our dean. In 2017, it was the 100th anniversary of the Edwards School of Business. And Dean was, and still is our own, football crazy uh, Dean. And that might explain the numerous football references I have used. In the past 15 years, the Edward School of Business has graduated approximately 5,000 students, and hopefully lots caught the entrepreneurial bug. Our guest speaker, a 2002 College of Commerce grad started Kirby Cars in 2017 with partner and co-founder Brent Goodlow. And though, although Alex came from a long line of entrepreneurs and started his first business in grade 11, he spent the first 15 years after graduating climbing the ladder of corporate finance at BDC, EDC, and CMHC, I think he likes the alphabet, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, the pull of sailing his own ship was too great, and he set sail on this new adventure. In the past five years, Kirby Cars raised $13.9 million, expanded to three provinces, and grew its team from two to 43. Along the way, they picked up a Sabex Award, as well as an ABEX New Venture Award. And as all entrepreneurs know from experience, the road to success is not smooth. And in most cases, paved with challenges and sometimes the knowledge gained from not reaching the final destination. It takes true grit, grit Alex, to acknowledge failure, but failure or learning experiences, as Maureen and I called our failures, are, necessary, are a necessary part of hardening the art entrepreneurial steel of persistence and instilling the courage to try again. Ladies and gentlemen, here to present the complete journey of Kirby Cars, Alex Kruder. Thank you so much. Gord, thank you for that introduction. That uh, was, I mean, you hit everything. <laughs> you hit all the notes. I think, um, you know, and thanks for inviting me here to, to speak today, Dean Willoughby. It's, uh, it's an honor to be uh, back at the school uh, talking to everybody. It's, um, actually, I was just saying at the beginning that the last time I was in this room was right after they built it. So I gave one of the first student speeches in this building after the construction of this center. Um, so it's, it's definitely been a minute since I've been here. Um, so, you know, 
what's interesting about this talk today is I, I actually looked back at many of the, the previous uh, speakers. I wanted to see what they were saying, how they talked, spoke about their journeys. And uh, what was, you know, seemed consistent was that there was always some ups, there were some downs, but when they came here, uh, they were always on a bit of a high. And, you know, this was the cherry on top. Um, it's a little different for me today, as, uh, as Gord alluded to. And um, so I'm a feel, I feel a bit vulnerable in front of, in front of you all. Um, but I'm happy about that in some ways because it's weird. Um, when I was first booked in to do this talk, I wanted to speak about vulnerability anyways because I thought it was a very important thing. At the time, and we'll get into this, things looked a little different than they do today. But now it's uh, a little, well, things have taken a different, uh, different change. And um, this is going to be a cradle-to-grave story of a startup company. But it's not a cradle-to-grave story about an entrepreneur. But... Uh, <laughs> So before we get into all of that, I just have a question for everyone in this room here. Who here has ever purchased a car? That is a lot of people. Now, everyone that had their hands up, who would describe that experience as being better than, say, 10 Super Bowls? <laughs> so when we founded Kirby, we had to go pitch for money. And what that meant was being in the room with, uh, you know, say 20 investors or so. They would range from being angels to venture capitalists. And you have sometimes like five minutes with these people to go connect with them. That was one of the lines that we would use, or that I would use, I should say, to go connect with them as quickly as possible. Because what you're trying to show them is the problem you're trying to solve. And the problem is the hardest thing to communicate to somebody that doesn't know what you're talking about. So imagine being in the ag tech sector, and you're talking to someone who's never been a farmer, and you're describing your problem. It's so hard. But people have, you know, for us, fortunately, people had purchased cars. And the problem that we were trying to solve was that buying experience. And it turns out that a lot of people know that it's not as good as 10 Super Bowls. So... Uh, this might surprise some of you, but I haven't always been an entrepreneur. And before I get to the next part here, I just got to say, I'm glad you guys are sitting down, Gord and Maureen, because this next part is kind of shocking. Although you kind of know some of it, I guess. Uh, Dean Willby, can you just please dial 911 on your phone? Don't hit send, though. Just, like, have it ready, okay? I'm worried about these two. So the big surprise is I used to work for the government. <laughs> <laughs> Is his heart still working? <laughs> and I promise you that working for the government is the literal exact opposite of being an entrepreneur. It's exactly what you think it is. And so this is my, my LinkedIn, my resume right here. So if you go to LinkedIn, you'll see this is a graphical form of LinkedIn. Um, I just put it together. So um, Gord mentioned that I started my first company when I was in grade 11. I ran my second company, actually, after my first year of university. Both of them were graphic design companies. And uh, what was nice about both of them was that um, it just kind of, there was an itch that I had to, had, had to scratch at the time. Um, and I wish I would have kept scratching that itch, but instead I kind of let, we'll get into it in a second, but I, I kind of got fearful of failure. And uh, part of it, I don't know, the seed was kind of sown back in high school. And in spite of a you know, fairly decent you know, university career, I was uh, involved in student politics, for example. I was a member of student council. So I represented the, uh, the, the faculty of commerce, it was called back then, to the U USSU, the, the, student, the head student union on campus. I was also commerce president at some point in time as well, if you can believe that. So we planned all the parties and had a great time. The dean and I, different dean, hung out together quite a bit. We'd go meet alumni and stuff. It was very fun. Um, but then after school, I didn't go back to entrepreneurship. I felt like doing it, but I just, man, it was so weird. I just felt like I needed to, I don't know. I was trying to keep up with the Joneses. I was kind of running away from who I was, honestly. I was trying to keep, I wanted to have a sweet job like everyone else has, and you know, compete with them on that level. And going into a big company was one of the easier places to do that with. It was always very challenging to, to tell someone that wasn't an entrepreneur uh, about your successes because they don't make any sense to these people, you know? And so I, I got stuck in working at BDC, and it was fantastic. You know, I really enjoyed it for the time that I was there. The training was amazing. So if, if anyone wants to go into corporate fi or sorry, commercial finance, I would say the BDC is not a bad place to go. 
Uh, it won't keep you there, though, because it didn't keep me, unless, you're, unless you love that kind of lifestyle. Eventually, though, I, I found my way to Export Development Canada some number of years later. And so this was a big, a big jump up. So working in domestic commercial finance to working in international finance, it was huge. And so the big thing, the big news at that, uh, during that time was Research in Motion. So who here remembers that company, Research in Motion? All right, so a few people. What, is someone tell me right now, what did they produce? What was their big product? Blackberry. The Blackberry, exactly. So now they're known as BlackBerry, they're a software company, but back in the day, BlackBerry was, uh, was the, the leading smartphone producer in the world. They were the one that created the mold. They broke the mold for phones at the time. They stole the whole business away globally from Nokia. It was a big deal. I supported those guys when I was at Export Development Canada. And this will blow your mind, but they were so big and growing so fast at that time that the entire balance sheet of the government of Canada, like the federal government of our country, could not support those guys. So a big portion of the work that I was doing there was finding private sector approaches to extending the balance sheet of the federal government to make sure they could support that business as it grew. As it grew sorry. And you know, why did I get that job? Well, I mean, I had an awesome education from the U of S here was the first thing. I mean, everyone talks about that. I also had, a, I've written a couple of CFA exams, so I was a, a fairly uh, accomplished you know, a finance professional at that point. But the biggest reason I got that job was because I also worked in tech for a little while. So I worked at two telecom concerns. The first company was my dad's company. They sold a wireline solution that extended the range of DSL. But the next company I worked for was in wireless. It was called Telesat. It's a satellite operator, where it's a Canadian company, fourth largest in the world, some of the most advanced technology in the world. It was a very interesting place to work. I launched two satellites when I was there and helped them build a broadband business. But the key thing was this. I understood and learned about Spectrum. It was the most, it's a, it's a finite resource. Uh, it's a renewable resource, but it's something that, you get li that gets licensed. And if you're operating either a satellite company or uh, a, a wireless cell phone company, it's the same thing. You need, uh, you need Spectrum. The people at EDC at that time just didn't know. So I got that job as a result. It was pretty sweet for a while. And then I got itchy and I had to move on. I just wasn't happy there. I had, to, had in my head that I had to manage money. I wanted to be in capital markets. And so I found my way to, to uh, CMHC. Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation. This was another big uh, a movement up. And so I managed a portfolio of $2 billion. It was, um, I was on the risk side of things, I should also add. Uh, it was um, uh, corporate bonds, um, common equity, public-private partnerships, and uh, structured products. So I got a, a, a very good experience with a lot of things, a very a large array of products. At the time, we were managing $750 billion of, uh, of mortgage exposure. And it was an interesting time for our business, too, because the, the mortgage market in the U.S. had just collapsed. And so every company in the space was trying to beef up on their risk management capability. So that's where I came in. And, so, and I had a very good background in risk management, it turns out. But my dilemma was, even though my job was, it should have been very fascinating, and like working for the government is, I mean, I'll be honest with you, it's kind of cushy. You know, you should be pretty happy with things. It should be a great life. But I was just miserable all the time. Like I literally felt like I was dying, and it was so frustrating. Oops. So, but why did I feel like I was dying? You know, it's a great question because I had a lot of success and I just really wanted to be happy and I just wanted to be satisfied with the place where I was at. I was really respected. It was so sad that I could stay. But the big thing was this. I was just really afraid of failing. And, um, and so as a result, I didn't go back out and try to found a new company. I didn't try to put my reputation was the big thing at risk. And this is an example here. This is a newspaper clipping that you can look up today. And it cites me because I was interviewed by the Globe and Mail. I think this is from 2012 or something. Yeah, 2012. So I found it a small, just as a hobby, because I, I was going nuts working for the government. And so I started this company just before uh, going to CMHC. I was going nuts, and I needed an outlet, a more creative one, to get some of, the, the, some of that energy out. So I founded a small company called Bridge Starter. Uh, what Bridge Starter did is uh, it helped foreign entrepreneurs launch projects on Kickstarter. Uh, who here is aware of what Kickstarter is? You guys, okay, actually quite a few people know. So Kickstarter is a crowdfunding platform, which is essentially a, a platform for pre-sales for companies. So if you're gonna, you, if you wanna launch a product but you're not sure if there's a market, you'll test it on Kickstarter. And if it surpasses a certain you know, amount of sales, then, then they call that a completed project, it's fully funded, and then you, you, know, you sell. And so it's kind of a way of raising money to get small things going, but it's good for products. And uh, so I got that started. 
Um, but, you know, in the first two weeks after I launched it, uh, there was fantastic uptake from customers. It was great. And the reason why it was, such a, uh, it was, a, it was a service people wanted was because uh, the only country it was available in was the United States. And I found a hack for myself to launch a project there. And I was able to productize that, and I, I could take it to others. And so I felt pretty happy about that. But I was still really reluctant about the entire thing. I didn't like, tell my friends about it. I don't, I don't even think I told my mom about it. Do you know about this company? Okay, she's a gem. <laughs> my mom is the best mom in the world. I don't know why I keep secrets from her. But I didn't, I didn't tell a lot of people about this business. But the Globe and Mail called me in the second week of operations. And they said, hey, crowdfunding's brand new. We'd like to talk to you because it sounds like you're doing a thing here. Are you interested? And I said no. And then the reason I said no was because I just didn't feel confident that this company was going to succeed. And uh, eventually I sort of twisted my own arm and I said, okay, fine, I'll, I'll do the interview, you know, one of those sorts of things. And then promptly, two days later, I got shut down by Amazon. And my worst fears were manifest in front of me. <laughs> and I was like, how the heck does this happen, you know? And so I didn't, I felt terrible about ca uh, canceling the interview with the Globe and Mail, so I took it anyways. And uh, this story, if you read it, it's very favorable to me. It's a David versus Goliath story about how, you know, Kickstarter uses Amazon just by some weird coincidence to do their payment processing, and Amazon decided to go and crush the small Canadian entrepreneur that was trying to help a lot of other entrepreneurs out. You know, it's a very favorable story. But I was so embarrassed about this thing, I didn't tell anybody about it. In fact, I tried my best to run away from it. And this is what I squandered in that, in that moment. I had every news agency in Canada contact me over the, like, the preceding like 12 months. And a lot of them was like within the first like few days after the story came out. I could have been, you know, I was the known quantity in Canada to talk about, to talk about crowdfunding. And I didn't. I ran away from it because I was too ashamed of this failure. And, I, you know, there's a whole lot that could have come out of that. But again, fear stopped me in my tracks. So I realized, I mean, I knew that there was something wrong with me when I, I saw all this potential that I was leaving on the floor, just on the table, whatever. And I knew I had to change and do something totally different. And it took a, I, so I just decided, it's weird, I actually ended up moving back into my mom's house. Because like, deciding to go and pursue something uh, entrepreneurial was so scary, I had to be back in the nest for this. So I came back to be closer to my family. I was closer to all the friends that I had you know, grown up around in Saskatoon here. And I just got reintegrated, and it really helped a lot. Like Saskatchewan, you probably, I mean, I've lived other places, and if you haven't lived other places, you might not know this, but it's a very nurturing place, and maybe even specifically Saskatoon. And it's a great place for starting a company. And so I was very fortunate to, to be able to do that here. And so, but along the way, I found this quote, and I think it's awesome, and it, it just, it says everything to me. Now, I've highlighted a couple parts in bold, but I'll read the whole thing, because it, me it meant a lot to me, and I'll tell you how I've seen all of it echoed back to me. So it says, nature loves courage. You make the commitment, and nature will respond to that commitment by removing impossible obstacles. Dream the impossible dream, and the world will not grind you under, it will lift you up. This is the trick. This is what all these teachers and philosophers who really counted, who really touched the al alchemical gold, this is what they understood. This is how magic is done, by hurling yourself into the abyss and discovering it's a feather, it's a feather bed. It's beautiful. And I'll tell you, like, when I first got Kirby going, so I'll just show you how much am I throwing myself into the abyss. I'm a non-technical founder trying to build a company, a tech company that sells cars online. I don't do any coding, and I, don't, I knew nothing about cars. I still can't do either of those things right now. And so I got to pull some magic out of something to go put, pull this thing together. And so as an example of, you know, the na uh, nature removing obstacles in front of us, one of the first things that we tried to do was find someone that could build technology for us and then someone who could help us brand this thing. So we found the technology piece relatively easily, but the, the, the marketing part of it was actually quite uh, challenging for us. And so one of, our first, uh, one of the first companies we, we, we spoke to was, it turned out, the largest one in the province, had no idea. They, they vetted me for 45 minutes before I got a chance to walk in and tell them what we were looking for. It was like, I was so offended. I don't even know why I went to this place, but I did. 
So we sit down, my business partner and me, and we're just talking about our business, and there's like six people there, and it's like rapid-fire questions for two hours. And I was blown away. I was like, I was like, why are you guys, like, why are you gr grilling me? <laughs> like, I'm, tr I'm trying to vet you to do business for, work for me, right? I was like so indignant. So finally, the, uh, one of the partners, he stands up, he's like, oh, shit, sorry. Uh, <laughs> He throws his pen down. Fiddlesticks. <laughs> he, he throws his pen down, and he says, he's like, fine, we'll, we're in, he says. And he goes, we think that you did a million-dollar campaign to launch this company, and we'll cover that. And so, obviously, very nonchalantly, I reach over to my business partner, and I say, hey, don't tell him anything, but he just bought the company. Because that's all we had at the time. So, I call this the heartbeat, and anyone who's been an entrepreneur probably recognizes it, because this is, I didn't make this, this graph, someone else put this together, and it, this, is, this is a day, this is the day in the life of an entrepreneur. <laughs> Every day is the best day and the worst day at the same time. It is wild. And so, uh, some, of those, some of those barriers that you're, uh, I was talking about, uh, it's these peaks here where you kind of get past them, but they like show up and um, yeah, and they just crush you sometimes. It is nuts. And it might take more than a day to get past it, but this is a very important part of, of the process. It, this is like going to the gym, you know? Uh, every low is a day at the gym, but every, every high is the day after you've recovered from your workout. And you're a little stronger than you were the day before. And you'll notice that it's got an upward trend to it because you get stronger all the time, and the things that beat you down the day before just don't do the same thing the next day. And like, so you can flex a little harder, you have a few more skills, it's pretty great. But this contrasts working for the government in a lot of ways. So working for the government, for example, it, there's not really ever a rainy day. Um, you know, the, the way it works in government is that if the economy happens to be falling apart, it's a good excuse to start hiring people because more people need your services. And government uses that as a way to offset. Uh, it's, uh, they call, it's like, um, uh, anyway, it, it's one of the automatic stabilizers that they use in the economy. If the economy is firing on all cylinders, it's a good time to hire people if you're the government too. <laughs> because you don't want the party to stop, right? And more companies need your help. And so it's just always a little bit, it's always quite level. And where I was working in the government, I was working in risk management near the end. And my job was to take all of these ups and downs in our investment portfolio and even them out make predictable returns. And so my job was to remove the heartbeat. No wonder it felt like dying every single day. <laughs> so let me talk a bit about Kirby. Um, how many people in the room here have heard of my, my, well, have heard of Kirby? Oh my goodness, that's a lot. <laughs> I, I fully expected like your hands to go up. And, and yours too, mom. Did you put your hand up? Okay. <laughs> She's a sweetheart. <laughs> So Kirby, um, so Kirby, uh, Kirby was Canada's first fully licensed online vehicle retailer. So we sold cars online, like Amazon sells everything. Now, who here is uh, either a startup founder or thinking of starting something up, wants to be involved in the startup space? Like two people? <laughs> okay, I'm going to encourage a few of you to try this out, okay? Because it's, it's more fun than that zig, zigzaggy line, you know, lets on. Um, what I'll say is this. If you're going to set out to go build a bigger company, and that's what Kirby had to be from the outset, it couldn't just, it, you know, the world of entrepreneurship could just be a single, a, a company with a single person. It could be a solo entrepreneur, for example, right? Um, if you're going to be building a, a company that, that needs a lot of scale, which this company did, you have to raise money, you need to build, bring a lot of people in, so there's got to be, you have to have skills with structuring and then leadership as well. And, that's, and there's, a, there's a universe where entrepreneurship and leadership cross over, and that's what helps you build bigger organizations. But raising capital is key to that. So for us, we had to raise money, and we did a good job of raising it. But what that means is, we sold cars, that was a product for sure, but our company was a product. And so this is, this is our track record of raising money. We, we, we raised more than just this here, but these are kind of the, uh, the, critical, the critical junctures. So in April of 2018, uh, we closed our first $2 million seed round. That was the largest seed round in tech in Saskatchewan history. So like a couple novices just like, you know, popped out. First thing we're doing, we're setting records. 
And so, like, I mean, I'll be frank with you, I felt like this at the time, and then 15 minutes later, I was scared because I had no idea what I was doing. You can't, you know, you take that kind of money, and you're like, ah, I got to make sure that this works out for everybody, you know? Um, in 2019, we were, also, we were also the recipient of a large loan from um, Western Economic Diversification, uh, and they are a fantastic supporter of tech and just business generally in Saskatchewan. And so, like, I mean, I know I used to work for the government, so I'm probably going to be a little bit sens uh, uh, sympathetic towards them, but, like, look towards them to help out because they do, honestly, the, the people there want to do good things. But our biggest round came in March of last year. And so we closed $7 million at that time. There was actually a bit more money that we closed too, but that was part of a, a separate deal. Um, but that was another record. So we, uh, there was another seed round for Kirby, and that was the new record for the largest seed round in the province because we beat our old record. So like, we felt pretty good about that for about three weeks. And then suddenly some other upstart, which I'm proud to say, uh, an ag tech business, they raised $20 million as their seed round. So that's pretty amazing. So one thing I'll say is that like, it's a good time to get involved in tech entrepreneurship in this province because there is money for it. There is a good support network. Like Anybody can give it a good go. So what happens when you raise money? Now, I wish I had some more graphs from Kirby. It's just that, uh, as I'm alluding to all the way through, the company doesn't exist anymore. I don't have access to all of our materials. But this is one graph that I did have. You can see here, sales just kind of like jumped up. They doubled overnight. And that's a big deal. So when you raise money, that's what you're looking for, obviously. And this wasn't even the end of it. Sales popped up even more after this. Um, the, the whole trend for the rest of the year was, it was all records for us. And that's exactly what you want, but it creates problems. You have to scale the company. And scaling is tremendously difficult sometimes. So imagine that you're already at capacity making the sales that you're, uh, that you're doing. Uh, maybe Gordon Moraine. Um, how challenging is it to, when you're at capacity, I don't know, double or triple sales the next month? How does it stretch you? Yeah, it's uh, very tough. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. Your finances get stretched. Suddenly, you need more people. And the thing is, like, since you're already at capacity, how do you even have time to hire the people? Then train those people. And not everybody works out. It's like a whole thing. There's, so the way that we went through our scaling is that we, um, we had to add structure to the business. We got trained on how to do these sorts of things. There's a lot. It, Believe me, you'll, you'll be uh, drinking from a fire hose the entire way through. It is very exciting. But what's the key thing? At the end of the day, you have to build a solid team. And the team is everything in the organization. Um, like, I've always taken a note from Simon Sinek, one of my favorite um, authors on leadership. And he says, you know, his advice is leaders eat last. And I think it's 100% true. Could be as the people that you lead, and especially with a company where you have to get bigger and you need to put structure in place and have lots of people there, it is critical that they feel safe when they're at work. And it's not just like their own, their own personal safety, but because you need them to extend themselves every single day. There are problems to solve at the company that you don't even know about, and you need them to take the initiative to go and do that. And if they don't, then things languish. The company slows down. You, know, you need a, a corporate culture that doesn't, that doesn't suffer micromanagers because those people hold everybody back. Suddenly, they're making decisions for everybody, and you don't want to be that person either. You need to embolden people to, to, make, to, to risk their reputations, to, to try new things to get the company ahead, and make them feel safe that if they fail, it's not a big deal. You know, everyone learns from failure. I learn from failure. That's what this whole thing is about. So give that to your people. And one thing I'll just say is this. Man, you know, I read a lot of, uh, a lot of what other leaders, uh, other uh, business founders and leaders, what they say to do. And almost universally, you know, the big guys like Bezos and so forth, they'll say, you know, hire the best people. And I always sit back and I'm like, really? Like, that's the advice that you have? Like, not the number two guy? Not the number three guy? Not the number four guy? Like, take the best one, really. Like, obviously, right? Like, why would you ever not hire the best person? Well, the reason is, if you have unlimited, uh, unlimited money, you totally can hire the best person probably every time. But we couldn't all the time at Kirby, so our challenges are different. Like, for example, you know, I wasn't the best CEO. We wanted the best CEO at Kirby. We, you know, we tried to get Bezos to come in, but you can't get him. <laughs> there wasn't enough money in the world to get Jeff Bezos to work for us. So what you really have to do is you're building the mighty ducks all the time. <laughs> Who here knows what MacGyver is? 
Okay. So for anyone who doesn't know who MacGyver is, it was an 80s TV show guy. And uh, he would always like, you know, cobble things together to get out of a sticky situation. It was very, it was awesome. Uh, but he was always, you know, kind of using science and just making it up. So he was hacking it. And that's what you're always doing. And the Mighty Ducks here, another 90s reference. Um, it's a movie about uh, uh, like a, a, a hockey team of like uh, elementary school kids, I think it was. And, uh, you know, they had one kid on the team that had very well-rounded skills but everybody else was just like an imperfect player. Like they had a guy with the hardest slap shot, but he couldn't skate. And there was a kid with the fastest reflexes, so he was great at goalie, but he was scared of the puck. <laughs> and this is what you're doing all the time. You're trying to take these people who are puzzle pieces and put them in the places that make the most sense the whole organization can work. But what's also critical is not just putting them where they succeed today, but helping them you know, be there tomorrow, because you still have to grow this business. And if you have to replace these people at every single step, it's not going to work for you. It's very hard. So you've got to teach that guy how to skate. You know, find a way to make that guy not afraid of the puck. <laughs> so you invest in your people. And, but, the, but here's the thing. It's like they'll be flattered every time you invest in them. They love it when you invest in them. But if falling on their face is going to embarrass them, they won't do it. They'll probably just leave. As soon as you try to like, hey, we have skating lessons for you, they're going to want to go because they know if they can't figure it out, then they need another job. And so it's got to, I can't stress enough that failure has to be part of your organization and that you have to allow for it and make it safe, maybe reward it even. So let's talk about where Kirby was. Um, so at its peak, we had, uh, uh, we had 43 employees. We had offices in Calgary and we had, uh, in Saskatoon. We had revenues in our last year of $10 million, and we raised a total of 14. I kind of rounded it up from what you said. You said 13.9. It was 14, in my opinion. <laughs> um, around 1,000 customers over the course of five years. So the question is this, like, what happened? Like, how do you go from this to being literally bankrupt in January of this year? Like, what the devil? You know, what the heck happened, right? <laughs> well, OK, sorry, I know. Look, here's the thing. I apologize to all the octogenarians in the room here. I, this old guy with pointing a gun at us is sort of kind of what killed Kirby, actually. It wasn't this exact old man, but it was kind of, uh, at least an old way of doing business. So the story is that back in September of last year, we got engaged to sell the company. And so it was to a, a very large, traditional uh, deal, a car dealership business. It was either the, the largest or second largest in the country. And that was going very well. We negotiated a, a letter of intent with the, the, the CEO of that company. And then it was about two months later that suddenly we noticed a, a distinct tonal and momentum change in how things were prog progressing. And so what happened was the CEO had handed down to the president of the company the responsibility to go finish this transaction to acquire us, but also to build their online used dealership business. And this is where things fell apart. That president didn't want to do the deal. He told me to my face and a bunch of other people that he, he, he thought it wasn't a good idea. So he found a way to undermine the deal. It became predatory, and eventually it just fell apart. And that's what happened. We weren't able to survive that, unfortunately. Like a lot of startup companies, you're just not awash in cash. And so as a result, when everything fell apart, you know, we weren't able to, we didn't have enough runway to raise more money. We didn't have enough cash to just keep operating. So that's what got us. In most of these businesses, to be honest with you, are built so that they can't fail. <laughs> Everything got asked to work. There's not a lot of backing up with, with startup tech companies. And that's, and that's what got us. Now, here's an interesting part of the story that uh, uh, I find. That president, six weeks later, was terminated from that company. And we're talking like disappeared. He has no LinkedIn anymore. He has no Twitter. He is gone. And there was no comment from him in the, in the press either. So, I mean, there you go, right? I know, okay, so that last part was a bit of a downer. So, you know, I'm sorry about that part. But it doesn't end here, okay? So, going back to that quote from a while ago, let me tell you about the feather bed, okay? So, you go through all this stuff, and uh, you're just like constantly up and down and up and down. And like, man, like we faced bankruptcy at Kirby literally at least once a year. So by the time we got to the end and we were facing it again, it wasn't a new thing. It's just this time we couldn't wiggle out of it. You know, that we did, I didn't have any more tricks up my sleeve. My, my hat uh, was out of rabbits. 
and so uh, it was a little bit it was a little bit sad but i'll be frank i was also exhausted so was my business partner and if i'm being honest probably the entire company was wiped out uh, so it was nice to get a rest because we put everything we had into this business like every i wouldn't say all the tears but like lots of sweat lots of blood so it ended i think unfortunately but at the same time like there was nothing that we could feel bad about because like geez we faced, a, we faced annihilation so many times and pulled it back from the brink. So, but what happened to our people? Well, we had jobs for 75% of our employees, you know, before the doors closed on this thing. Everybody wanted Kirby employees. And the reason they want them is because when well, you saw that zigzaggy line, it crushes people into diamonds as you go through. And every single one of those people is a high performer. Like every single one of them. Because if they weren't, they self-selected and left the company, you know? And we had very few people actually leave. We were very good at hiring people that just matched the corporate culture and could take the rigor of, uh, of this lifestyle. So, I mean, very proud about all that. Almost everybody that moved on has a raise afterwards. And again, the re and they got higher positions at other businesses. You know, and they're at better companies than Kirby was because they're better funded. And so, like, the, the future is bright for everybody that worked here. For my business partner, it's the same. He was very successful in, his, in finding a, um, a new career after Kirby. Uh, again, same as everyone else, you know, higher position. Well, I shouldn't say higher position, but definitely for uh, higher compensation. And then my story is kind of the same, actually. I'm one of those guys that failed up in this entire thing. Um, it took me a few weeks after the company closed to want to talk about it. I, I, I had to take a break. I was exhausted. And like, I'll tell you, it was very strange handing the keys, of, like the literal physical keys for the company over to the bankruptcy trustee. And like, here's the other weird thing. Thank goodness we could go bankrupt. That's a rich person's way out. I didn't even realize that. But anyway, so, <laughs> <laughs> so it was a relief that we could do that. And so I took a couple weeks to relax. I came back to Saskatoon and I began talking a bit, of, a bit about our experience to some other startup founders that I knew and other people in the community. And uh, after the first week, I had four job offers. It was like almost immediate. It was like four days of talking to people, four job offers. And I was just like, this is nuts. I thought I'd be radioactive you know, as a failed CEO when this thing was over, but that was not true. I finally accepted a job uh, with uh, one of Kirby's investors, actually. Uh, it's a company called Agrimatics. So, and I found this, uh, the reason I took this position, there was a few reasons for it, but the first one is that I really, I think the company had the best prospects of the businesses that, I would, you know, that I'd spoken to. I knew the people that were in charge of it, and they're awesome. Um, I think their skill sets and mine are very complementary. But the other reason I took it is because this is an investor, you know, someone that, you know, that they invested in me to begin with. They believed in me. You know, it didn't work out that well, but they, <laughs> they liked me so much, they want me to start to come work for them for more money. Anyway, so this is the thing. It's the feather mattress, the feather bed is real experiences everything, and you don't get to be a king without taking a few slings and arrows. So this is, uh, this is all I have for today, but I want to leave you with this picture. This is, the, uh, this is a photo of the leadership team at Kirby uh, on one of our planning sessions that we had up in Canmore. And uh, we, you know, th there was a lot of talk here, uh, but this, this is just before we got engaged to actually sell the business. And um, Everyone here, you probably can't tell, but I wore them out. We took this long hike, and uh, they're, I mean, I can't say it was nothing for me, but like, not everyone hikes like I do. So the point is, they're, they're pretty exhausted, but you can see that they're fighters. Like, everyone's just in it. Uh, great team to work with. I hope to see them all again at some point in time. Working with them again would be amazing. And I also think it's a pretty epic photo. <laughs> Anyway, thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you for the opportunity to, to talk to everyone today. This has been fantastic. Um, yeah. Awesome. <laughs> well, Ox, we're not going to let you off the hook that easily. <laughs> so there's some time now where we have um, current entrepreneurs, future entrepreneurs, a in aspiring entrepreneurs who want to be inspired by your story. Um, so this time, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for you to ask questions, comments for our guest speaker today. Let's open the floor for, go ahead. Uh, it's a great question. I think there, there's two things that were always inherent to, to me, and I can't call them skills necessarily, but things that I was just 
like, pretty good at to begin with. And they lent themselves well to, uh, to building a company like Kirby, which is to say uh, it, it was you know, a business from scratch that needed a lot of people at it. Um, so uh, there's the entrepreneurship piece of it. And uh, entrepreneurship can look like lots of things. It could be small businesses, it can be large. But someone starting something, and they have a knack for spotting opportunity, they have a knack for, um, for structuring something, like figuring out how to exploit an opportunity or deliver a service or something. Exploit sounds bad, but you're always trying to help a customer out. The other piece is leadership. And people, I have a knack for that. People, I mean, I'm not the best leader, I'm still learning how to do all that stuff, but I do know that people like to follow me. And when you cross those two things over, that's what enables you to build a bigger enterprise. You need to be able to do both those things. So my business partner, for example, you know, he was really good at cars. That was his thing. I knew nothing about cars, so we had to pair up. But it took, like, it took, I had to figure out that I needed a person to do that. And then there's a way to structure an, or, an organization around that person and then plus everybody else. So those are the two things that I brought to the table. Ah, thank you for asking that question. The, the answer is, uh, you know, uh, imposter syndrome rules my life. Less so today than it ever did before. Um, I always thought I had no idea how we survived day to day, frankly. And it took every bit of uh, anything I had to, like, start it, honestly. Uh, so like, did I have faith that it was going to go anywhere? Uh, the answer is, like, I wish I could say that I thought we were going to sell it from the beginning, but I, I felt so fortunate all the way along that uh, we found a way to stay alive every single day. And I wish I could say that I had a bigger plan than that, but I didn't. Um, but it took, but what I found was I built a lot of resources within myself. So when we got to the end, so every company that raises money always wants to sell at the end. You always need an exit. You want to make money for your investors. You want to make money for yourself. And it's at least, it's, 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 a, it's an accomplishment. And so like for, to provide some context here, for startup tech companies, that sell in five years, 2% of them get that opportunity. So we were one of that 2%. And that like you can say that, you know, and so that's remarkable, you know? That is <laughs> uh, fuddle-duddle remarkable. <laughs> and we did it from here in Saskatchewan, of all places, right? So anyway, we didn't stick the landing, but I'll be frank with you, I sort of feel like we had the carpet kind of ripped out from under our feet a little. But what's interesting is, what caught, now that we have this experience and knowing what I know today, the carpet won't be ripped out like it was this last time. The reason is that, you know, out of ignorance, we played things a certain way, and I know what we were trying to do, but we wouldn't do it again that way. So we exposed ourselves to risk. And so while we didn't, it wasn't our fault that the deal ended in any way, shape, or form, we didn't protect ourselves the way that we could have. And it wouldn't have guaranteed that the deal would have been done. It just means that we either could have gotten to the end faster or we, we could have in, insulated ourselves against the risks of this, this rogue president. Oh, wow, we've got lots of questions. All right. I'm interested, you mentioned imposter syndrome. Yeah. Oh, geez. <laughs> it's a good question. You know what? I honestly I just talked a lot about it. That was the biggest thing. I mean, I picked up a lot of healthy habits along the way. I you know, picked up meditation, which I still do every morning. I, I, you know, I picked up yoga for a long time. I'm back at it again because I find that like, the stress just kind of builds up in the body. And if you work the body out, you become aware of what's bothering you. And you can meditate on that and figure it out. So it helps a lot. But the biggest thing is just like, acknowledging it and getting it out there. So being vulnerable, honestly. Uh, just kind of like this. And so like, now all of you people know <laughs> about, the, uh, about my business failure. Um, and I don't have to worry about that with you anymore. Is, you know, but, I mean, unless you guys are going to be mean about it or something. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you, uh, your hand was up? Yeah, I was just back there. You were in the full application of that? Totally, yeah. Yeah, can you speak to how being in a company like that, being an entrepreneur, incubator, helps you? 
you know, I'll tell you, like, unfortunately, very fundamentally, it helped. Because, like, part of me wants to say that I just knew it all from the beginning. This super accomplished finance guy comes into this space. Of course, I raised all this money, you know? I mean, it's, like, real easy. Just pay it out. That's not what happened at all. What really happened was uh, our conception of running Kirby was that we were just going to start selling cars online, and we would self-fund it, and it would be a small, organically grown business. And that's all we were going to do. Um, it was just going to be me and Brent, and we would hire people as we got bigger. That was it. And that was in, uh, probably an idiot move, because uh, we sat down with, uh, we got invited to join Collabs, and we didn't, I didn't even want to go there, frankly. But a friend of mine was on the board, and he said, yeah, you should talk to them. So sat down, and I had a discussion with this one guy, Jeff Dick, and, uh, and he sa he's, he's like, he says, he says yeah, you got to raise money. And he just put his hand like that. And I was like, no, well, we're not going to do that. And he says, no, you need to, because here's the reason. He says, um, by the time we showed up in Collabs, it was August of 2018, I guess, or 17, 17. And um, our model of influence was this company called Carvana. So we would always say that we were the Carvana of Canada. And anyway, Carvana had actually exited by this point. So when we started Kirby, it didn't, it, they hadn't exited, but by April of that year, they did. And so he said, look, investors are going to be looking for companies just like Carvana. And if you don't take their money, someone else will. And then you're going to compete with those guys. And would you rather do that or take the money today and have someone else, you know, less well-funded compete with you? And so then that was a pretty good case for raising money. And it changed the direction of everything entirely. And so I'd say that, you know, while I want to say that I didn't have to learn anything from Collabs, I learned a lot from Collabs. It was really valuable. Uh, there was another hand up over here somewhere. Okay, you know what? I had a slide on this. I just I, I ran out of time because I, you know, I'm sorry, Dean Willoughby, but like I had like 90 minutes of content for you people. <laughs> <laughs> and and one, one of the slides was, uh, was a, uh, probably uh, my style of leadership was most informed by uh, Captain Jean-Luc Picard from Star Trek. <laughs> so anyone that, well, now you know, but a lot of people that know me also know that and now, he's not real, but I'll tell you the reasons why I like this guy, and, uh, but I'll also give you a real uh, an example of someone in, in real life that I, that I like. Um, but the reason why Jean-Luc Picard was amazing is because uh, just like, say, Superman, who I also like, uh, he leads with ethics and morals. Like it's, it, he, you know, he gives his people a higher purpose in everything they do because every, they know that whatever happens, they've done something that contributes to the greater good. And that's a huge thing for people at work. I can't stress that enough. If you're just going to go to work to hawk cars, I mean, I don't know. But if you're going to go there to change the way that people buy cars to make it a better thing, that's kind of good. If you're going to deliver a really good experience every single time so that people don't get ripped off. Like, we had people that joined us all the time that either had purchased a car and it wasn't 10 Super Bowls of fun, or there were people that worked at a car dealership and they're like, man, it sucks being a jerk all the time. And so, and I think that's great. So you had good people on your team. Anyway, the difference between Superman and, and uh, Captain Picard, though, is that Superman, yeah, he's very moral in everything he does, but he's also bulletproof. He doesn't even need food. He lives off the sun. So there's no consequences for him, you know, in trying to be a moral person. But Picard has the same, he's as, he's as fragile as the rest of us are. He happened to have a sweet job, you know, being captain of the Enterprise, but, like, he had career risk. He had, he had to go against, you know, his bosses all the time. And that's what happens to real people. And so I think that, like, so, that's, so I like his leadership style. He puts his people, his team first. I think that's critical. Um, and he gives them a higher purpose, you know, every day when they're at work. So that's why I think he's fantastic. But a real-world example of that, I think pe some people that understand that would be like Simon Sinek. He's a guy I alluded to before. He's a leadership consultant that, I mean, I don't know everything he's ever said, but, you know, I've read a couple of his books. I've <laughs> listened to every one of his TED Talks. Um, and this is what he talks about. Leaders eat last. So, you know, take care of your people, and they'll take care of you. Gordon? Gordon? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. 
I mean, honestly, it's just to take it, <laughs> whatever it is. There, there, there isn't really a wrong first step. It's just you have to do it, I would say. It's just, uh, yeah, just take the first, take the step, whatever it is. Uh, like there was, a, I, uh, I listened to a podcast a while ago about saving money and investing and so forth. And they said, like, w- what's the first step to saving? And they just said, do it. <laughs> and I think it's the same thing. I mean, it's, it, sorry, it sounds kind of, um, yeah, because the hardest thing is the first step, whatever you choose to do. And the thing is, like, once you, once you take one step, it's like a domino effect. The next one becomes easier. Like, there's this, uh, actually, in this picture here, what you don't see is, um, th- this is only half of the hike. There's a, we went a little further, and it's, like, way steeper. And we get to this oasis uh, up, in the, up in the mountains, and it's surrounded, I call it Shangri-La, because it's surrounded by all these mountain peaks. And so it's like, you know, there's like lots of wind here, but when you get to this Shangri-La place, there's no wind. It's just, it's temperate, it's beautiful, there's a lake there. And so I said to everyone, I said, you know, uh, it's 15 kilometers to get to this point. And I said, like, look, I've never been beyond this point before, but I can tell you that the first step to whatever comes next is over there. And I said, it's the same thing with the company. I don't know what's happening next, because at this point we didn't know we were, we were going to sell it. Um, and so I said, but, you know, uh, I have a feeling, feeling that whatever the step is after the next one, we'll figure it out. And that's what you have to believe, is you're going to always figure out the next step. And the more ups and downs you go through, the more self-confidence you get. Like, honestly, right now I feel kind of bulletproof, whereas, like, if you compared me to five years ago when I got Kirby started, that guy was made of balsa wood. <laughs> like, uh, but still, he made it through. He's here right now, you know? And he's a bit more bulletproof. A bit more Superman, a little bit less, you know, Jean-Luc Picard. But that's, hey, that's fine. <laughs> Jean-Luc Picard's a government man anyways. We all know that, right? <laughs> Thank <you>. All right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Alex, thank you for um, showing us how to take the first step and also the next step. You know, I love that phrase, we're down, fail up, so the ability to look at things positively, so thank you. I'd like to bring up Mr. Gord Haddock, and stay up here, Alex. Oh, Go ahead, Gord. <laughs> yeah, well, we are just going to, uh, oh, I forgot, I got a mic, I can walk around. After, we'll have a picture, and we've got a, a treat bag as well, but... This is an original painting by Denise Klett, who now works for Disney, and she's from Saskatoon, and we were do, have done a lot of things with Denise in the past. But uh, I thought this painting was appropriate. It's me trying to push a three-quarter ton grain truck that is sideways across the highway at night, <laughs> and I can see car lights coming over the hill. So. Anyways, um, you'd have to read the book to find out what happened. But uh, I thought this would be a great... Oops, there we go. Perfect. And uh, yeah, we've got uh, uh, the books for you as well. So anyways, I thought the tie-in with the cars was kind of significant. (laughs) So thank you. Thank you very much. And we'll go after, we'll go t- take some photos with that. Want me to sit down now? Yeah, <laughs> yep, you can sit down. <laughs> no, you, can. Uh, I, you know, there's a quote, um, come to the edge, no, we will fall. Come to the edge, no, we will fall. Come to the edge. They came to the edge, he pushed them, and they flew. So, What I have found in our 50-some years of being in business is, you know, the worst days when you look back, the worst things that happen to you turn out to be the best. And you can check with entrepreneurs. It happens all the time. You think this, oh, this is terrible. And then if that event had not happened, you wouldn't be where you are over here. So that's one thing that uh, is important to always Keep in the back of your mind. The other thing is, if you're going to be entrepreneurial, but everybody else is what, as well, choose the right life partner. <laughs> it's so important because in days that you've just had, and days that we've had, and you come home and say, well, <clears throat> it's uh, all over. We owe a lot of money. And... Uh, 
uh, you know, and your wife says, uh, well, what are we going to do next? <laughs> That's a pretty inspiring statement to get, so.